but welcome to everybody who's watching on Facebook. And I will hand over to Mario Priha from Helsinki Zoo, who's going to give some official uh, opening remarks for the session. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Mario Priha, and I work as an educator in Helsinki Zoo, and I'm also a member of the Education Committee and the Conservation Committee. And I'm really happy to open this plenary, Engage or Go Extinct. And it will be in the format of a discussion panel, and it's all about conservation education and its potential to contribute to in-situ conservation, so to field work and projects in the natural environments of animal species. As we know, conservation education needs close cooperation with conservation specialists, stakeholders and educators. But uh, what are the challenges, expectations and what is needed for success in in-situ conservation? This morning we have invited eight conservation and education professionals, both from the zoo world as from the field, and they will share stories and opinions from their different perspectives. And as we heard, this session will be facilitated by Laura Myers and Meryl Zimmerman from the EASA Executive Office. And now they will take over to introduction of today's panelists. All right. Thank you very much, Mario, for, for that uh, very nice introduction to the session. Um, so yes, yeah, so I, I, I'm Laura and um, I'm working at the EASA office and the, my reason for being involved in this is because I'm the liaison for our education committee. So I'm working with Mario on the education committee and Meryl, who will be taking over for the second part of the session, is the liaison for the conservation committee. So she works with Mario in that capacity. Um, so the way that the session is going to work today is we will start off with some uh, pre-selected topics uh, for our panelists to discuss. Uh, that will be the first part and then Meryl will take over towards the end of the session and she'll be bringing in uh, your comments and questions in the audience. Um, so I will, before I kick over to our panelists introduce themselves, I will quickly introduce the, uh, the room just to show a little bit the results from the poll. Um, so if you can't see them on screen, I'll just run through them quickly. So the first question was looking at uh, whereabouts do you work? So what type of audience do we have in the room? Uh, so it looks like most people are actually from zoos and aquariums. We have a few popping in from institute organizations. Hopefully we'll see more people coming in a bit later on. And we also have quite a few people who are uh, in education, either studying or working themselves. And looking at whether or not people's organizations are directly involved in collaborations between uh, zoos and aquariums and institute projects. Mostly yes, which is great. So we have about half the people in the room who are uh, working for an organization um, that is doing institute work uh, or a collaborative project with a zoo and aquarium and are actually working on that themselves. So very welcome. And uh, another chunk of people who are not directly involved but their organization does do that sort of collaborative work and just a few people who are let's say not yet involved in that sort of collaboration and last question we were just trying to figure out who, who where in the world everybody is and um, so it looks like most of you are joining us here in europe and so the correct greeting is good morning a few people who are joining us from slightly later time zone and uh, shout out to our few heroes who are joining us uh, in the middle of the night including one of our panelists um, okay, so I will now hand over and if I can ask, first of all, Simon to give a quick introduction to yourself for the panel and I'll pop up a screen with everyone's photo on. Okay, um, good morning everyone or good evening or good night. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Simon Brusland, I'm Danish but I work in Germany and I work at the Marlow Bird Park and uh, I do the conservation part in our zoo and I'm responsible for following up on projects, uh, finding projects and um, helping them in addition to 
sending them some money when we have enough to send. And, um, and I'm very fortunate about this and it's a really great chance to, and within EASA, I work with birds. So I'm in the, uh, I'm chair of the parrot tag. I'm vice chair of the passerine tag and I, I'm also a member of the conservation Great, thank you very much. And um, just pass over to Eddie to give a quick introduction. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Eddie. I work in Copenhagen Zoo, uh, where I'm lucky enough to work both in the zoo and in the field with uh, our conservation work on the noble Schaefer beetle, as well as assisting on our amphibian projects, uh, both in the zoo and in the field. Great, and over to Molly next. Hello, I'm Molly Malloy with Denver Zoo in Denver, Colorado in the United States. I'm our conservation leadership manager, so I work in our field conservation department where I work in capacity building of adults, either through higher education or through our in-situ uh, programs, primarily in Botswana. Um, so primarily I have experience working in Southern Africa with um, community engagement and conservation education programs that support our larger conservation uh, projects. Great. Um, and Molly is our uh, panelist who's joining in the middle of the night, so thank you for staying up for us. Uh, I'll throw over to Constance next. Hello everybody, my name is Constance Nager. I work in the Royal Burger Zoo in the Netherlands. And my job title is actually Manager Conservation Research and Education, which is a whole lot. To be true, I think 80% of my time I use for education. But uh, in the last few years, I was very happy to be part of the EASA conservation campaign teams for the Great Ape campaign, for example, also for the uh, Madagascar uh, campaign. And lately, I did a little bit as well on uh, the education part of the Silent Forest campaign. And I've experienced in quite some uh, projects in the tropic from Gabon to Belize, where Burger Zoo has its major conservation project. So working on both sides, but mainly here in Europe and mainly on education. Great. And next up, I'll uh, turn to uh, Hannah, please. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Hannah Brooks. I'm a Community Engagement Manager at Chester Zoo. So I oversee our outreach education work, which includes here in the UK, but also supporting our field partners um, so there's various different field partners that we support in capacity building with their education programs. Great. And uh, Michael, if you could give us a quick introduction. Hello everyone, my name is Michael. I work as a conservation education officer for Big Life Foundation based in the Amboseli ecosystem in southern Kenya. My work majorly involves visiting public schools within the Amboseli ecosystem to deliver conservation education lessons aside from doing community awareness meetings and conservation with projects that are in line with big life conservation projects that are centered in the community. Great. And Ian? Can you Hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon from Indonesia. Um, I go back to the zoo world. I started my career at Ripsnade, then Edinburgh before eight years at Jersey Zoo in the British Channel Islands. Then 20 years ago, founded the Sumatran Orangutan Conservation Program here in Northern Sumatra, Indonesia, where we work on all aspects of orangutan conservation, uh, reproduction to form new populations, habitat protection, all those things, research. Uh, but I'm especially interested in this uh, panel because we're <clears throat> right now developing a thing called the, that way, the Orangutan Haven, uh, which is kind of going to be a long-term sanctuary for orangutans we can't release. Uh, and open to the visiting public and school groups. So I'm really interested to explore some of the uh, experiences of the zoo education community during this panel. Great, and you're very welcome. And finally, we'll go to Matt for a quick introduction. Hi, good afternoon, everyone from Laos. Um, I'm Matt Hunt, I'm CEO of Free the Bears. Uh, we have five uh, bear rescue centers or wildlife sanctuaries in Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. Uh, which between them welcome upwards of half a million visitors each year. Um, so besides working to combat illegal wildlife trade, uh, helping government with placement of rescued bears, we obviously do quite a lot of work with in terms of uh, public education, outreach, 
uh, ranging from mobile education units to community engagement programs on site at the sanctuaries and further afield looking at social science and behavior change campaigns to try and reduce the demand for uh, bear products in the region. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and for those of you who were joining during those introductions, and um, we do have a, a handout as well with some information about all of our panelists. Uh, it's already been shared in the chat and Meryl's just reshared it. So if you didn't already have the link, then it's in there again for you. All right, okay, so if I can advance my slides, we will move on to our first question for the day, uh, which is basically just to get an overview of why education is an important part of in-situ conservation work. Um, and I wanted to start off by uh, throwing this question over to Hannah. Um, okay, yes. Yeah, so it, for me, I actually think that education is an essential part of in-situ conservation work. If we look at the root cause of most conservation issues, then it, it's linked in some way to human impact. So unless we're involving humans in being part of the solution, then that impact isn't going to go away. So it's either a case of ring fencing species that we want to protect or working alongside the communities that live next to those species, whether it be plants or animals, whether they be in direct contact or not, to make sure that they can live alongside each other and um, do that harmoniously. And in order to do that, I think education is the way, education and engagement, providing people with the knowledge and skills and capacity that they need in order to be able to live alongside the wildlife that they are currently um, putting at risk. And, and it's not always the communities directly alongside that are always affecting. So it's important that we also work with um, communities around the world to educate about uh, different global issues as well. Great, thank you. Um, and I also ask uh, Ian to come in. Obviously, you just told us that, that you have some exciting education uh, work coming up potentially with Orangutan Haven. So, yeah, I'd love to get your, your thoughts on why it's important. You might need to unmute yourself, Ian. You know, we, as, I, as I said, we try and tackle sort of all aspects of Orangutan conservation here. So we have various different types of programs in different areas. So we have a reintroduction uh, site with local communities around that forest. We have habitat protection work again with local communities and, and one of the most important things we need them to do is to buy into the, to the project and to understand it uh, and, and to tolerate as our activities sometimes. So education is very much a, an important role of getting local buy-in and local acceptance and support for a lot of the work. Uh, it's also extremely valuable because you're starting from a very low uh, baseline. I mean we we tend to, you know, it's pretty, I think it's pretty clear that a lot of these rural local communities in places like Indonesia have a very, um, I'm not going to say backward, but nowhere near the education levels that uh, you would have in the West. And so they're coming from a very uh, basic baseline. Um, and, you know, just understanding, you know, what wildlife is out there, what the value of the rainforest is and everything are all new concepts to a, a lot of people there. Uh, and ultimately we want to change uh, behaviors. Yeah? And when the only way we're going to do that is uh, making people aware of you know, what happens uh, around them according to business as usual and, and what happens around them if things change and uh, people are more respectful for the environment and this, all the services it provides. So I think uh, it's essential in many factors. Yeah, thank you very much. And I have to say I'm in complete agreement with the two of you. Um, and then wanted to uh, throw over to uh, Simon to, to comment on this. He was another member of our conservation committee and done quite a bit of uh, conservation education work with the Silent Forest campaign as well. And Thanks, Laura. Well, I think I, Hannah and Ian said it perf perfectly. You know, it's, it's about engaging local communities. It's getting buy-in. It's getting... Um, you know, you cannot separate hardly anywhere in the world. Now you can separate people from wildlife and nature. So, so you need to work with the people. But I think an important part of the engagement of local communities is also using that as analysis of the local communities. You find out who is, who is behind you, who is maybe not, and who is not so supportive. So you can kind of start to understand your local communities beyond educating them as well. So that's, that's another aspect of why it's important to engage them. 
Yeah, thanks. And I think uh, in some of our previous discussions, Simon also made the, the really good point that sometimes we framed it as uh, educators, uh, but it's actually, it's also maybe about just the skill set that you have to have those kind of engagement skills. Uh, so whether we say that everybody needs to uh, have a, a little bit of those skills or whether we say that actually everybody should think of themselves as an educator. Uh, I think we could probably go both ways on that argument. And I don't know if there are any other panelists who wanted to uh, come in quickly on this topic before we go on to the next. Yeah, Eddie? Yeah, just to say that the, the things that Ian are mentioning in, in Indonesia is, is completely the same thing that we're facing here in Europe. I mean, working with a beetle and amphibian projects in Denmark, it's the same thing. Um, I think conservation is, is more about people than about animals sometimes. And uh, to get involved and, and involved in local communities also going to uh, make you drink a lot of coffee with them and, and, and have chats. I mean, that's education on a level where where it's working you have to involve these people and you have to hear their points of view uh, and 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 you have to have a kind of, of humble um, approach to it so so you can so you can actually involve them on on the project so to be out there and, and meet them and, and have the coffee time is, is really valuable I'm only here. Sorry, had to unmute. Um, yes, I, I agree with everything everyone has already stated. And when we talk about education, that education should be reciprocal. So it's not necessarily just what us as educators are bringing to a project, but it's what we can learn from working and engaging with those partners and communities so that we can better understand the full landscape from a social um, and ecological perspective. So we talk about education, we should be thinking about it from what we as the practitioners are also learning in this process so that um, when there are collaborations, um, it can be much more holistic. Um, and as someone has already talked about, that buy-in, so that buy-in and that trust is there from the beginning. Great, thank you. And I think that's a, a wonderful segue into our next a question which is actually looking at yeah why do we do this um, so we wanted to start with talking to uh, our in-situ representatives so yeah why do you uh, sorry to some of our Z representatives about why they collaborate with uh, in-situ projects um, so if we could go to Hannah I think on on this one that would be great if you Want to talk a little bit about what's what uh, what do you get out of the collaboration yeah well um just as his mission is preventing extinction and unless we're working with in situ projects then we can't do that we do an awful lot within the zoo setting in terms of conservation breeding and education and engagement with communities that visit the zoo but unless we're looking at the one plan approach and also looking at these species their habitats and where they are trying to survive in the wild then we won't be able to protect the species in the wild, which is the, the end goal of what we want to do. Um, and as Chester Zoo, we've got a lot of knowledge and experience that we can use to support our in situ partners to be able to increase their capacity to do what they're doing in the field. So by working in collaboration, we can support those field partners to improve what they're doing and to have the end result of working towards the mission that we're trying to achieve. Great, thank you. And I'm going to throw this one back to uh, Simon again, who's coming from a more kind of traditional conservation rather than education background, shall we say? Yeah, well, um, like Hannah says, it's it's in the merit of Zeus, but um, I'm, I'm I'm old enough to have been in, in the zoo world long enough to have experienced I think we lost Simon. We lost Simon, yep. Okay. Um, well, hopefully he can uh, come, come back and give us the benefit of his uh, experience. Um, are you back, Simon? Let me try and get him back. And uh... Okay, uh, in that case, I guess I will come back to Molly and see if you wanted to add anything additional to uh, 
to what uh, Hannah has said and <laughs> the first part of what we heard from, from Simon. <laughs> Uh, yes, I think as zoos and aquariums, we're always um, looking to measure that impact that we're having on biodiversity and on wildlife, and that includes the impact that we're having beyond our gates. So when we, when we look at in situ projects uh, collaborating, um, like Hannah said, zoos and aquariums are able to bring a plethora of resources that can um, help build the capacity of other practitioners on the ground, expertise in uh, education, animal welfare. But also, I think what we can be getting out of that is looking at collaborations that exceed those boundaries around the ecological lens. So looking, we've already talked about that conservation at the core of it is people. So looking at other sectors uh, for those collaborations with institute projects, perhaps in the sustainable development world or the public health world that help us really truly get that holistic view of the issue at all angles. Um, and we talked about stakeholders. And so collaborations can be key if we look creatively and innovatively, which Coming from a North American zoo, we haven't historically always been good at that. And so I think that's something we are trying to do a better job of, of trying to get out of a tunnel vision conservation biology mindset when we approach conservation and conservation solutions. So collaborating with institute projects and other um, partners outside of the conservation world can really be beneficial. Great. Um... Simon, are you back with us? I can see you popped yeah, back I'm up. Sorry, the yeah, internet yeah. is uh, always the uh, best timing when it goes. Yeah, of um, course. So, so the subject was uh, why do we support conservation? And I was saying that in, in the early times for my uh, involvement in conservation, it was more about what is, what is a good project, what makes us look good and stuff. And that has evolved as I've been working in different institutions and where I'm working now, we actually quite uh, like Hannah said, we have it as a part of what we do. Conservation is integrated, it's something we want to do. And actually, our conservation focus is, is a little bit more directional to species that doesn't get enough attention. So we're not even looking at the sexy species that we can we can sell the best. We're looking for the projects that that nobody else is supporting because maybe it's not interesting enough or important uh, in terms of uh, how you sell the species, but the species still need the conservation. Yeah, great. Thank you. And I was just looking quickly in the chat, I can see there's a, a comment um, from Andy Moore about uh, educating visitors as well. And I can certainly say for, from my experience that having been a, a zoo educator who was able to visit some uh, not in situ, but in country projects, it really made my uh, experience as an educator in the zoo a, a lot richer uh, to be able to come back and speak with a bit more authenticity. And there's also a comment from uh, Mikael in Copenhagen uh, about zoos running uh, in situ projects and your in situ project can also be uh, a local project. Um, and of course we have Eddie uh, on the panel who's doing just that. So Eddie, I don't know if there was anything that you wanted to bring into that. Yeah. I think uh, an important part, something that I experience is that when, when we as a zoo involved in a project like that, or, or when we start up a project like that, um, we are the one who are facilitating the collaboration. I mean, we are, we come as a zoo and not as an authority. So we can actually gather all these uh, participants, the, the stakeholders, the, the schools, the, the landowners, whatever, um, and, and we can gather them around the project, around the zoo, because we're not, I think, dangerous in their mind. We, 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 we come for the animals, so we have a good case uh, and, and we have a, a nice thing to, to sell. Um, so so when, when we as a zoo come with a, a, a suggestion of making this project, uh, it's very easy uh, because we have a, a, a good brand, we have a good understanding among common people that, that uh, when, when the zoo does stuff, it's for the animals. So it's quite easy to facilitate this collaboration, actually, to get people who, who know, don't normally talk together, uh, and neighbors and stuff like that, to, to throw in their land for a project that we facilitate. 
Um, so I think it's it's important to see us as a resource that Zeus can be the thing that people will gather around to to involve in a project like that. Great, thank you. And I'd now like to uh, bring in, obviously uh, we have Eddie doing in situ work, of course, and um, but to bring in some of our uh, overseas uh, participants. So this again to hear from from the uh, field projects why what you get out of the collaboration with zoos and aquariums, why you would pick a zoo or an aquarium over another uh, partner to work with. Um, so if I can start off by asking Matt to comment on this question. Thanks. Um, I, I, I'd definitely say state straight away, um, you wouldn't necessarily pick a zoo over another partner. Like, I've kind of been out here for 20 odd years um, and prior to that worked in zoos and for certain when I first arrived in Southeast Asia, there was a bit of a them and us kind of attitude between field conservation people and zoos. And I think over the years, um, certainly everybody is starting to recognize the, the vital role that each different person has to play. And, and frankly, the, the situation's getting worse and worse all the time. So if we can't work together with other people wanting to do conservation, then we're truly doomed. Um, in terms of why, why collaborate with zoos and aquariums, uh, from a wildlife sanctuary or wildlife rescue center perspective, I always say, you know, the view for the animals on the inside is the same. They generally don't have a clue whether they're in a, a zoo or a wildlife rescue center. And in fact, the, the similarities are, are far more than there are differences. The, the roles that we have to perform beyond the simple placement of rescued wildlife, the, the changing of people's hearts and minds, um, the, the capturing people, the, the opportunities to educate people and inspire them to care for wildlife are so similar. But unfortunately, many of the organizations um, working in the field are, are hugely stretched financially. And I, I know everyone is familiar with that. But I would say, you know, for certain, you know, we're, we're less resourced than um, <coughs> bigger zoos. And so there, there's a huge talent pool out there that we can hopefully tap into and work together to achieve similar aims. Great. Thank you very much for that. And can kind of bring in um, Michael uh, to yeah, talk about you know, your experience with uh, collaboration and, and what, what do you get out of the collaborations with zoos that you have? Hey, Michael, I'm not sure if you're hearing us. Yeah, yeah I can hear yeah, you. Perfect. Yeah, yeah as, as Alia said, it is really important to work with zoos and there's really important partners and they say the similarities are more than the differences and the benefits that we get from working with zoos, ranging from the knowledge and the skills and the expertise that they have to build the capacity that you already have in the ground and to make sure that the impact in the ground is really big. So there is a lot that we get from zoos aside from the financial support and the help. Sorry. Oh, no, I think we lost you for a second, but you're back. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry. So just to repeat, I was saying that conservation educators in the field really get help in skills and experience and the expertise that zoo ed zoos have and zoo educators have and ag aquariums. So we really get help with these resources and they are very resourceful partners that we, that we really value their help and what you get from them and that knowledge and skills really helps us to build. So we really, really value their efforts and what we get from them and uh, just to, uh, to, to, to help us. And uh, just to talk about the resources that we get from them, these resources help us to deliver conservation education in these fields and in these areas. So it's really important. Okay. Thank you very much. And then, yeah, we'll come back to you, Ian, just if you have anything to uh, add on to your collaboration experiences. And basically, uh, a lot. I mean, the, I, I thought we were just going to talk about collaboration in terms of education, but we've gone on to a wider subject. But the, I mean, you can't question the amount of veterinary experience out there in the zoo community 
compared to one or two wildlife rescue centers. I mean, it's vast, right? And, uh, and, and animal record keeping systems and all these things are exactly the same kind of things that we need to be using. Um, but the, the best thing about our experience with zoos is that it tends to be regular. You know, it's very, it's very rare that you get a one-off donation from a zoo and then you never hear from them again. You tend to get another one next year and another one after that. And those regular, uh, predictable amounts are extremely nice to have when you're in a, a situation like ours where you live from one year to the next. It's, uh, the zoo relationships tend to be extremely good long-term ones. In terms of education work, I mean, the... The, there's just such a wealth of experience out there. Our, our audiences are similar. They're everything from young kids to, to adults, from businessmen to tradesmen and stuff like that. Uh, there's a whole load of methods and techniques that have been tried and tested over many years in many different countries and scenarios, and we should be able to, to learn from that experience and benefit from that as well. Uh, there's a massive, huge diversity of different ideas. I'm sure people in Europe do things a bit different to American zoos and different again from other zoos. So there's all these things that we, that we nearly really need to be drawing on. And our, our typical tendency as a local, say Indonesian NGO is to hire local Indonesians to do all our education work. And they come from a, a relatively low education background themselves, very narrow uh, view or knowledge base of uh, options and methods and materials. Um, and, and so they tend to get stuck in their narrow little methodologies whereas there's a massive resource out there to tap on if we can if we can use it. great thank you and uh, yeah i'd say ian you're you're also you're looking for some education expertise at the moment right with your project so maybe well, yeah, we, we, drop a haven, link to that in the chat as well yeah the haven we're developing is is going to be kind of like a zoo but very different and so they i see that the people with the most experience to help us design the education right there right? It's, it's people from the zoo community Right. Thank you. Okay. All right. So moving on. So we just wanted to have uh, some general discussion on, you know, similarities and differences between, you know, the work that you're doing in situ and the work that you're doing in the zoo. We've already heard a little bit. Um, obviously, sometimes it's maybe not so different. You may even be in, in the same part of the world, um, but sometimes there can be quite some differences. So I wanted to uh, go to Constanza first. That's okay. Well, as an educator at heart, I guess uh, for both zoos and in situ projects, when you do education, and I'm going to say a harsh thing, it's, in my opinion, important to realize that it's not about smiley, happy children's faces. I think the point to start with education is to think what is the, the aim learning out, output, the behavior change we aim for, and not thinking, well, we have a little bit of time, a little bit of resources, let's go to a classroom, tell a nice story, and that's it. So. At first, the first step is to have a good concept and, and a real good plan what you want to achieve with your education efforts. And uh, then see what is the, really the, the aimed learning outcome, then look for target groups, and then tailor your, your program. And I think that is the way that SUS and in situ project should work with the education. So having a good, clear strategic plan in the first place, I guess, is very, very important. Um, yeah. I tell from my own experience, indeed, our Belize project says, yeah we, yeah, we do education and we have the same project for four-year-olds and for university students. Uh, that's a nice thing, but you could do better. So we can advise in that and really get more results out of the efforts you put in there. Um, differences, some practical stuff, of course, materials, when I think about something like, easy like information panels, well, in tropical conditions, it's quite happening quite often that after six months they grow mushrooms when you use normal material. So you have to be aware of the local circumstances and everything. That's clear, of course. And also when we have, when we talk about behavior change we may aim at, it's quite a difference if we expect people in Europe to think a bit about the use of plastics or for people somewhere else in, in situ projects that we aim for a real uh, very large change of livelihood. Uh, to expect them to stop uh, catching fish because there's overfishing in the region when they have three generation of fishers in their family. So the consequences, we have to be really clear that the consequences of the behavior change you want to see might be much larger in the local communities and we have to be very, very sensitive about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right, if I can bring in Molly next on this. 
Jacqueline? Yes, um, I agree with everything that was just said. I think from similarities, <clears throat> our overall approach is generally the same. We're looking at how conservation education can have some kind of influence on um, attitudes or behavior or value systems even. Uh, we are trying to create positive experiences around wildlife and nature. Um, so I think at the core of it, when we're working with people and looking at behavior change, those are where a lot of those uh, similarities and those common threads. Uh, we're working with human beings. So, um, you know, no matter where we're working, those are some of the core pillars of, of what we're trying to do. But where the differences come in, and I think uh, this is something that educators are, do such a great job of, is understanding uh, the different dynamics that often are at play. We're, we're possibly looking at age appropriateness or we're looking at cultural uh, layers that, that change the dynamics, um, teaching styles even. Um, and so it's not a one size fits all approach to education. Um, and sometimes educators are often seen in that way of just go in, do your thing, do your teaching with the, with the kids. Um, and it's not, that's not conservation education anymore. Conservation education is much larger. It's social science. It's bringing in all of these other disciplines that examine all of the human and social and cultural contexts and layers at play. And so, um, Sure, resources and strategies uh, might overlap, but we have to take each situation and then examine it and look at all of the dynamics and, and systems and, and layers that are at play. And educators um, have that innate ability to, to look at, at their audiences and who they're working with and really be able to be nimble and understand where they may need to shift um, their strategies. Um, so similarities that I think at the key of it is human beings. And, and I have to say one, one personal experience I had that was a good reminder to me that when I was working in Botswana and we wore, we, um, did a very play-based, um, uh, activity with some, uh, primary age school children and the head, headmaster came over to us later and said, you know, children, no matter where they are in the world, they all learn through play, don't they? Um, and so that was a good reminder to me as an educator to, um, to keep that in mind. Um, so, so again, I agree with what's already been said, um, but I think um, educators innately, um, we're, very, we're very nimble and we're able to switch gears when we need to be, we're able to assess um, the, the dynamics and where things need to shift. Great, thank you. And uh, come back and bring in Eddie on this one, I guess, because I think, uh, uh, you know, you, you maybe haven't experienced the, the cultural differences working on local biodiversity, perhaps, and um, that you do, but maybe there are still some big differences you find between the work going on in the zoo and the work going on in situ. Yeah, well, I'm lucky enough to work in, in both ends of the projects, um, but, but I will totally agree on what Molly said. And I think the most important part in that is to, to really involve our educators. Uh, if, you're, if you are an educator yourself, or if you have uh, the keepers as educators, or if you have, uh, um, what do you call them, trained educators to do your stuff, uh, the, the most important part is to involve these people and, and engage them because through their, commitment to their dedication you will have um, that the yeah their enthusiasm will, will actually uh, shine through so so as more as you can involve these people they know how to sell the good but but you have to really engage them um, we have brought our educators to conferences and and to uh, um, what do you call it nature gatherings to festivals kind of activities and and when they're out there they are standing to sell the project, even though they don't get their hands in. Uh, but if you remember them in, in the daily thing, to involve them in, in the news feed and, and uh, in, in what you call them, successes and, and failures on your projects, to really give them an ownership to it, they are always uh, well prepared to, to thank God for, for the project. So, so the key thing for us is, is involvement, I think, for them. Great. 
Okay, I think Hannah wants to comment on this. Uh, yeah, I just Simon also. Okay, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add um, something to consider if anyone's thinking about sort of setting up new partnerships in terms of similarities. One thing that we always consider when we're saying what support we can offer to in situ projects is we go based on the expertise and the experience that we have within our team at Chester Zoo. So we make sure that it's something that we're really good at before we go out there and we try and say that, that we're in a position to help others. Um, to make sure that we're offering the best support possible in the right areas that we can have the most impact. Great. And Simon? Yeah, I, I just want to come quickly back to the original question about similarities and differences with um, education in the zoo and maybe um, in, in Seattle somewhere far away. And um, I have an example from the Silent Forest campaign where we had um, the idea that our educative materials should be exported to Indonesia, to um, Southeast Asia and be used there as well. And it was kind of one of our aims from the beginning of the campaign. Um, and actually, when we presented the educative material to our partners in Indonesia, they all went, well, you cannot show people this. They're going to go all want to go out and catch birds to keep them safe if they buy into this. So. Um, so the, the same educative message that we had in Europe, which was upbeat and positive and, and very much about uh, educating the public and, and telling the public why it's good to support this, uh, would have had an opposite effect in, in CETOP. So uh, we actually had to, to look at and working with our partners in developing a separate education strategy in CETOP. Great, thanks. And I think that gives us a nice lead into the next sort of just a subset of the same topic really, which was to uh, actually think a little bit more explicitly about the managing cultural differences. Um, I think maybe Simon and Constance can also talk about the cultural differences of moving from one point to another. So it's not, you don't have to go too far to, to bump up against that. But I did want to start by offering our uh, uh, panelists from further afield to uh, have a chat and comment. So I know Matt and Ian have both obviously moved from, from Europe to uh, uh, Southeast Asia. And then we have uh, Michael um, joining us uh, from Kenya and, and collaborating with uh, European and I'm sure North American organizations as well. Um, so do, do any of you kind of have anything you wanted to comment on? Uh, do you find that presents a, a, a challenge and, and ways to overcome? Yeah, Matt, do you want to start us off? Yeah, I, I absolutely would say, you know, the, the cultural differences are vast. They're not, you know, between East and West, they're between, you know, Northern Lao and Southern Lao. Um, so as soon as people start thinking, oh, well, take this idea from here and transplant it somewhere else and that will work, I think you're, you know, on the road to ruin straight away. One of the um, most interesting chats we've ever had as, as a team doing education and outreach was around the time of this um, campaign of Love Not Loss and, you know, conservation optimism and all of this kind of thing and and it was a case where we we had a, a zoo based educators uh, ed educators come in and helping us and they were very adamant about keeping positive messaging and soft soft you know you're not allowed to say don't do this to anybody and uh, photos must all be positive and brightly lit and happy and and it it's the first time that I put something out on email to my team across three different countries and all of them came back and said no way this this just won't work you know here the newspapers have pictures of dead people on them on the front cover on a daily basis you know where two out of the three countries we're working in are, are communist the third is different um, but you know the people here are very used to being told you can do this, you cannot do this. You know, it's such a different environment to, to a zoo in, in Europe where you've got paying guests coming in and, and you're needing to make sure that you engage them in a, in a different way. Um, but yeah, absolutely. And I think somebody was just mentioning social science. Um, you know, Cambodia is meant to be the most homogenous society in mainland Southeast Asia. 90% of people there are Khmer. And as soon as we got into social science, everybody thought, you know, why do people use 
their products, uh, it's because of this, this, and this. And, and we're discovering that it's different in every province, the, the uses and, and people are just so different. So never ever. And I, I saw the silent forest campaign materials and, and had a giggle as well. Cause I think I was sent a box of them from Poland. <laughs> <laughs> definitely a big challenge uh ian or michael did you have anything you wanted to add on this i have a few thoughts yeah they i mean they yeah the culture thing it's something we hear a lot but i tend to find that once you get down to realities it's economics that really makes a difference and uh i think you know once you start talking to local communities around habitat or around species or in, it's it's how it impacts their livelihoods that makes the difference uh, and once you can bring those issues up and start talking about numbers and things like that then you can start to get these people on your side um uh, i have a, another little story too about cultural differences the, the years ago there was an is, initiative to d discuss the idea of having world heritage species uh, and the western sort of conservationists thought the obvious animals to have as the first uh, herit world heritage species would be the great apes. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Yeah. And then we had a seminar in Paris with a whole bunch of um, esteemed French philosophers there. And they were saying, actually, you know, the world heritage species should be your, so your cow, uh, the elephant, you know, the goat and the dog and things like that. Things that have really impacted uh, human culture uh, and the chicken. Uh, and then, you know, they mentioned, they, they also pointed out that, you know, local people in great ape habitat, you know, they tend to ridicule the apes because they are too human-like. So they deal with that by laughing at the funny chimpanzee and making fun of it. And, and they're not considered, you know, esteemed great ape world heritage species or anything like that. They're objects of ridicule. So it's just a good example of how diverse uh, cultural perceptions of conservation of species can be. But I do find that once you start talking about how much money people have in their pocket, they really want to listen, yeah. no matter what culture they're from. Definitely. Um, Michael, did you, did you have a, any comments to add on this one? Yes, I do have comments about this, and it is really important to manage these cultural differences especially when you're bringing something outside, let's say the content or information elsewhere, and just transferring it or transplanting it into a different place, geographical area or different places in the world where people have different cultures and these cultures shape their worldview and everything, ranging from political to social to environmental and everything. So there's a need to bridge these differences to make sure that you really get to understand the areas correctly. For example, here in the Amboseli ecosystem, mostly the people that we have here are the Maasai. And if you look at the culture here, then lion killing is really something that they take they, over generations. They tell the, the, the Morans know that killing a lion is, is, is prestige, is a show of courage. And also keeping lots of livestock and having many kids is a sign of royalty and wealth. So you have to be careful to navigate most of these things to better understand and deliver conservation education. And considering that we get help and resources from Chester Zoo, for example, we work with Chester and other partners. So there's a need to bridge this to make sure that you tailor the content into locally accepted and appropriate one to understand either culturally or, 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 or politically or any other ways, considering that here, uh, it's a major challenge because we are working with communities in their own land, as, as, as opposed to zoos, where these are protected areas, parks and zoos. So it's, that is really a challenge. So there is a need because now we have to tailor that content. And also working with local partners, for example, Big Life here, we know, and we have been here for years, and we know the community and I understand them, they have developed the trust and we know the most practical solutions and the real relevant challenges that they have here and also working with the communities because their own, it's, this is their own land, they have to understand but the baseline is these communities also need to understand and appreciate 
and know the importance of wildlife and habitat and natural resource protection, and also about the large scale impacts of populations that, that can have on the environment, and also how this can affect their own lives. So it's really important to understand most of these things so that you can navigate and avoid most of these emotive topics. For example, what we have here is land, and it's land that you are dealing with them and their own personal land. So we have to really understand and know most of these differences and to make sure to bridge them and work with them, and that one will work seamlessly. Great, thank you. And uh, yeah, I think it's kind of circles back maybe a little bit to Constanza's point about, you know, the, the strategic foundations uh, are, are very often the same. So that can be a really valuable thing that uh, an area for uh, zoos and in situ uh, projects to collaborate on potentially that it's not a case of taking just the materials from one to another. Um, all right, moving on okay and just kind of wanted to wrap up this little topic just by thinking about how do you actually go about linking uh, the work that's being supported and done in situ how that links back to what's going on uh, in your home institution so i wanted to throw that back to some of our zoo and aquarium folks um so let's maybe go back to uh, constance first of all yeah thank you um I think as, as a zoo, we made a quite very happy decision already 30 years ago. That is that we have one main project that we support for many, many years. And of course, to linking the uh, in situ project back to your zoos, no matter if it's staff or year card holders or uh, one time visitors, it's much easier if you can have a very clear message. This is our conservation project. This is why we do it. This is what we do. Please support us. Please give us your money. And uh, that's much easier than if you. Uh, spend a little money on 20 projects and switch them every year. It's much more difficult to get a connection with a, with a project then. So in, uh, in Burger Zoo, no matter if we have a staff meeting four times a year, one of the points on the agenda is always what's going on in Belize. Uh, in, intranet, once every two weeks, a message from Belize. We, have a, we do not have a zoo supporters club, but we have a project Belize Supporters Club with 100 members that come together twice a, a year. And we even have uh, sent quite a lot of people to visit the project in real uh, for the marketing manager to make a marketing plan together with them, the zoo designer to help them design their butterfly aviary, butterfly exhibit that they have there as well. And uh, also volunteer guides because they are the ones to, so, so to bring the message over here in Europe to the, to the people to, during guided tours, info tables or whatever. So I think we're in a very lucky position that about 50 of our staff and volunteer members have really seen the project in real, which is of course quite, uh, quite strange maybe, but that helps a lot in, in getting the partnerships. We know the people there, we see the 35 staff people there, kind of our colleagues as well. And that is, of course, a very, very happy situation. And also one of our seven areas in the zoo is really dedicated to the Belize habitat. So it's quite easy to talk about that. Great, thank you. And then um, Molly, if I can bring you in, I know you talked about this as a challenge with getting staff buy-in and uh, seeing the relevance. Yes, I think, um, I think for our zoo, um, in particular, we, um, we're so focused on telling those stories about um, those connections from our collection to our institute projects, but we're so focused on the outward um, facing stories, how we can share those stories with our guests, um, with our audiences who are visiting the zoo or our donors. I mean, there are some great stories, right? Of, how we're testing the field equipment on our scenarios vultures at the zoo so that they're all ready to go over to Mongolia or camera traps. Those are great stories that we can help make those leaps and those connections. But where I, f I feel we often fail is not focusing on the inward, on the internal staff and fostering a culture of conservation within our own organization. I think we've had a history of conservation happens in one department and everybody else just supports it. We think we're not entirely sure. There's such disconnect to the larger organizational goals for biodiversity and conservation. So getting staff 
engaged. And that engagement looks different at many levels. Um, helps to foster a culture and an ethos of this is the organization you work for. This is what we stand for. This is what we do. And so we have been able to bring in other departments and their expertise to help in our in-situ projects, like um, sending someone to Borneo to help um, build some enclosures for rehabilitation organization or educators or our vet staff. Um, and so that helps, but we can't make those opportunities for everyone. So I think it's something that our organization is very committed to is helping to make our staff and our volunteers feel more connected to our work that we do outside of our gates. Uh, we feel pretty confident about what we do on campus, but outward, there is still a big disconnect. And when you have um, staff who are, are interfacing with our guests and our audiences on a pretty regular basis, to, for them to feel equipped with these stories and, and a better understanding of what our organization stands for, that momentum will really help nurture this overall um, culture within our own organization um, that I feel. And I feel that's been something that we have not done well, but we are, we are committed to doing that better. Great. And if I could just throw that back to, uh, well, I'll let Ian jump in, then we'll throw it back to Eddie um, to talk about the local part. Ian, yeah, go ahead. Comment, yeah. The, um, just to explain the Orangutan Haven a little bit, the, the, the need for it came because we've got over 20 years we've accumulated eight orangutans that we can't release in the wild. They're full of air rifle bullets and all those blind, whatever. Um, we decided we would try and build enclosures for these animals that were large grassy islands surrounded by moats, very much like we had in Jersey two years ago. Uh, we secured an area of land that's 50 hectares and it's within an hour of the city of Medan, which is three to four million people. Uh, and a lot of the directors and bosses of major farm or plantation companies and mining companies are based here and will use and visit the haven on a regular basis. So it's a real opportunity for us to change behavior. Uh, but I thought in the beginning as well, I thought the, the quarantine center that we run for orangutans is close to the public. So nobody can see the standards that we implement and the procedures that we go through to check the health of all these animals and welfare of these animals. And I thought, well, if we can do things properly in the haven and have visitors, we can start to improve people's perception of animal welfare and try and raise zoo standards by leading by example. And I thought, okay, so we, we end up building a, a model for Indonesian zoos. And then it suddenly dawned on me that actually in many ways we're maybe building a model for global zoos because uh, not just the animal, the orangutans themselves, but well, as far as possible, all the buildings are being built out of sustainable materials using sustainable methods. Uh, energy generation will be done on site by hydroelectric and solar panel. Uh, waste disposal will be done as environmentally friendly as we possibly can, recycling, uh, minimum use of plastics and all these kind of things. So uh, it just struck me one day that, uh, you know, not only is this haven going to be hopefully a model for Indonesian zoos and improve standards of animal welfare, but it potentially is a model for every zoo all over the place because I've been to a, a lot of them and as uh, Molly mentioned there's a lot of double standards in terms of what you're expecting people to do and, and then you look out the back and see the thousands and thousands of plastic bottles that are just going to end up in some uh, landfill somewhere. But I think zoos really do have to take that seriously uh, uh, but it is possible. Yeah? Thank Great, thank you. Okay, and um, Eddie if you wanted to just talk about because I think local it's it's sometimes it's easier and sometimes it's uh, more challenging to to get uh, people involved yeah and I just want to say that Molly said it perfectly well and, and all the challenges that that uh, people that zoos are facing to to bring out the measures in in their own zoo uh, why do we work on the projects that we're working in and how do we get all to to participate on that and an ambassador for that um, I don't have the solution for it because we're really struggling with it in Copenhagen as well. Um, we do all these great projects, but how do we get our own staff involved in them and how do we get them to feel passionate about it, feeling a part of it? And that's from, I mean, that's from CEOs to, to coffee sellers. Uh, everybody should, should take part in that um, to, to really 
uh, face our, our visitors, our guests with it and, 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 and implement it. Uh, and I don't have the exact key for it, but I think one of them would, would be involvement. Like I said earlier, bringing them in on, on, uh, on failures and successes, uh, putting them in in news feeds and, and, uh, and, and making them feel invited. Um, yeah, it's, it's really good to hear that, that it's not just our uh, zoo that have a problem with implementing that, uh, bringing it out to, to, through the ranks. Um, but, but I don't have the exact key for it, except that when you're involved in a project directly, um, it's, it should be you and, and your enthusiasm on your project. And you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't feel too good to talk to anybody about it. Or, and, and you should really, uh, you shouldn't underestimate the role that, that anybody in the zoo can play in that from, from workers to, uh, to, to uh, leaders. Um, so, so you have to be really passionate about your thing and, and just get people involved, get them engaged. Great, thank you very much. All right, and conscious that we are, uh, time, is, time is running and we're having some great discussions, but also wanna make sure that we do get to bring in uh, a few of our wonderful questions from the audience as well. Uh, so the next thing we wanted to cover uh, was, what do you expect to get out of the collaboration? So I was gonna throw over to one person from each of our three groups. So the in-situ, the uh, zoo educators and the uh, zoo conservationists. Uh, just to kind of briefly say what your expectations are, um, uh, specifically looking around uh, collaborations to do with education. And I will also put a poll up for the audience, um, which is just to kind of get your feeling about what types of work do you think that uh, collaboration work do you think can go on in terms of education? Um, so Matt, if I could ask you to comment first on uh, your sort of expectations when you're collaborating with the Susan Aquariums on education? Yeah, I, I would say, um, I, I tend to sort of say that all of our relationships as, as humans tend to be like uh, uh, marriages, you know, whether that's our relationships with government partners or, or donors or zoo partners or international partners. And I think really you should be going into each thing looking at, at what you want out of that relationship out that time and, and how you can find um, common ground because I think um, as Hannah was saying earlier you know there are some zoos that have the money and and are quite happy to give a grant and then um, you know put that in their newsletter or whatever and that's all the involvement they want you have other zoos that want to do staff exchanges um, you have some that want to do, you know, real workshops and skills exchange. And, and, and we, we have, we're very fortunate to have a bunch of zoo partners around the world, ranging from very small to very big. And, and each of those relationships is completely unique. You know, we, we look at, we sit down. I, I think that the, the most important thing is make sure that everybody wants to do something long term together and then sit down and figure out what's realistic from from both parties and 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 see where you've got common ground. Great, thank you. Um, and then um, Constance next. I could go back to you. Well, to keep it short, I think uh, education in C2 X C2 can just cross fertilize each other and it's lovely to see what what is done in the field and bring back to the zoo and and if our expertise or advice if wanted as well. Um, All together with another hat from a conservation officer, as mentioned in the beginning, uh, nature conservation is about people and about humans. So I think if we invest in education, I hope to get out a better result of the whole conservation project actually, to make sure that our funding is, is more effective on the long run, run in really conserving nature. Great. Um, and uh, Simon, if we come to you. Um, I think when, when I think about what I expect from, from education as a part, it's, um, let's say, from the individual educator, we might expect them to, to uh, understand and help sell the project, so to say, to the audience in the zoo. Um, but um, you may also 
more generally from, from zoo educators as such. Um, I might also maybe, let's say from the side of the conservation committee, I might have a small expectation. I, I'd like to see educators taking on this kind of in situ community engagement as a separate discipline, something that they could kind of focus homing on, be better at and, and provide more info to. So it's, it's additional to educating in the zoo, it's this, this kind of community engagement. Because every time you write a grant application or whatever, community engagement is something you talk about and, and, and touch base on, but it's not always fully understand, understood what it is and, and what it involves. And then you could use much more feedback from the educators in the zoo. And then finally, I think uh, what I really like to, um, what you said in the beginning, Laura, was that I think we're, if we work in a zoo, we are all educators in our sense. And um, we can only become better at it. And, and of course, if we're fortunate in the zoo to have uh, full-time, formally educated educators, then we can use that resource more effectively and, and all become better at educating. Great, thank you. And I just popped the results of the, the poll up uh, on the screen and you can see the most popular option is still uh, educators working on, on complementary activities that they deliver in their own zoo or aquarium, but it's really encouraging to see uh, just how positive everyone is about all the different range of options. So that's going from um, materials to be used in situ to actually working more on like the strategy development training um, for in situ staff, uh, supporting with evaluation um, and also things like the really kind of higher level activities like getting involved with global species management plans. So I think it's it's uh, great that the audience is uh, sharing some of our buy in on, on the range of things that uh, educators can can be a part of um, okay just to kind of finish off the sort of um, prepared section I wanted to ask just to talk through uh, an example of uh, collaborative working because we're lucky to have um, Hannah from Chester and uh, Michael from Big Life Foundation uh, who have been sort of working together on on a, on a project uh, linked to conservation education out in Kenya so I was hoping that the two of them would be able to finish by just uh, talking us through uh, you know what they've been doing and, and how the experience has, has gone. Um, so yeah Michael if you don't mind I'll, I'll start with a little overview. I'll keep it very brief because uh, of the interest in time but I'm more than happy to talk through what we did and our story and, and my contact details are in the information. Um, so Chester Zoo have been long-term supporters of Big Lab Foundation, particularly focused on the Maasai Olympics, which is um, a fantastic event, which happens every other year. Um, but back in 2016, Big Lab Foundation reached out because they would developed a new outreach program going into schools. They developed content and um, activities that they were delivering and they, they wanted our support to review that and see if they could you know, measure the impact and, and make sure that they were having impact. Um, so it took a little while to get the ball rolling, as is often the case, but in 2018 I went over um, to Kenya, was lucky to meet the Big Life team and get to see their outreach education programme in practice, but more importantly brought all of their team together that were involved in education or community engagement in any way to work collaboratively and I facilitated a, a workshop to help them to develop a strategy for their education programme. Um, and off the back of that, key things came out that Chester Zoo could continue to support with. Um, so following on from that, we've helped them to, um, you know, re redevelop their outreach program to make sure that it, it really is having the most impact possible, provide some extra training for Michael so that he's delivering um, to the best uh, of his capabilities and also to start to develop new avenues that we can support them with, for example, teach training. Um, and alongside this, as we are trying to make sure that the project is having conservation impact, we're also supporting them with our skills from our social scientists with how they can evaluate the school's programme as well. Great. And yeah, Michael, if you want to add your comments, you need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, so for a long time, just as you have been working at Big Life Foundation, maybe something that Hannah has left out is that for close to 17 years now at more, 
Chester Sue has been working with Big Life through grants to the Rhino support and uh, towards protection of the critically endangered Eastern Black Rhinos that are found in the Chulu Hills and also supporting, as she has said, the Masai Olympics, a good, good, good pr program that targets the young Morans that we have around here and also that has really has had a very great impact in the continued in increment or also helping to have the number of lions increase within the Amboseli ecosystem. And lately it has also helped with the technical support in also working together in developing the curriculum. Also we have reciprocal visit from the Chester Zoo staff and also the Big Life staff. And also we are looking on avenues to see that we don't just get to students, but also get to teachers. So that's something, again, we are looking forward to doing. And also, aside from that, we are also targeting other ways to make sure that we reach the community in the best way possible. So working with Chester Zoo has been really important and the support has really helped us to develop the capacity and improve on the already existing ways on delivering conservation education and helping us in other projects that are geared towards the community to make sure that we provide the best possible. Great. Uh, thank you very much to the two of you. Um, and I will hand over to Meryl now, who hopefully will be able to bring in uh, at least one or two of, of your questions. Uh, we did say that we needed about four hours for this session, and I think that's that's proven right. There's a lot to discuss, but I'll pass over to Meryl to bring in the audience. Yes. So, yeah, agree. We could go on for hours and hours. Um, uh, I have received some questions. Uh, I said we will be able to go through them all, but um, uh, one of the first questions that we received was from Peter Galbucera. Peter, if you are still there, can you maybe unmute yourself and uh, ask your question? And maybe state uh, where you are from. I think we have to ask him to unmute one second. I have unmuted you, Peter. You can go ahead and start talking. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Go on. so um, basically I really like this session because I'm also very much in favor of education. I think it's key to conservation. And uh, I also better understand now that uh, there's two sides to education. It's not only educating the people, but it's also we have to learn about these people and, um, uh, and learn how to engage with them. So it's a, a two-way communication. Um, so I think to better do this job, I think we have to learn uh, to work together with a social scientist. Um, and some of you have already mentioned this. Um, I think Hannah and Simon were really much uh, in favor of working with social scientists, but, but probably others, uh, I don't know. Uh, that's my question a bit. Uh, how many of you are working with social scientists and really taking this uh, issue of understanding local societies uh, in a professional way. I guess we can focus this maybe on either Ian, Matt or Michael initially, or do you have, does anybody else want to say something? I think Matt raising his hand, go ahead, Matt. Yes, um, I, I mentioned earlier, we've been uh, working with uh, San Diego Zoo Global and the conservation education division for uh, five or six years now to better understand the the motivations behind people buying and using bear products um something that you know if you google it people will say people use bear bile and traditional chinese medicine that's it and, and it's believed to be so simple and and i think you know this came after frida bear's work in in this region and on this issue for 20 years and what we've discovered is with everything that we learn, for every piece of information that we learn, we discover there's two to three more things that we don't really know about properly yet, or, or we still need to understand more. So 
absolutely, you know, getting the social science involved in all of these education programs, um, totally necessary, but hugely complicated. And I would say possibly one of the big threats is that um, issues tend to change so quickly. You know, the reason why people are using tigers or poaching tigers or consuming pangolins or, or you know, cutting down forests will change over a few years. And, and it's very difficult to, to properly examine issues and get a really good understanding in a, in a time frame that allows you to then take action while that information is still relevant. But for sure, we need to do a lot more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you enthusiastically wanted to say something as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, just, uh, just to point out that uh, around most of our sort of field programs in that lot, we've done quite detailed socioeconomic surveys, you know, like uh, around the Tapanoli, around the kind of habitat, we visited some of like, you know, well over 3,000 recipients from 360 villages over like, two years. But uh, again, it depends what your goal is, and, and, and every member of society has a different, um, different need and different interest. And, uh, you know, we have to distinguish between the decision makers of tomorrow with the ones of today. And for things like elephants and, and tabernacle orangutans, it's the ones that, that make decisions today that are priority number one. Um, and so, you know, we do do a lot of that work. We, do, we don't just go in there blind. We try and tailor uh, all of our materials and methods to, to the needs and the, and the goals of the project. Uh, but priorities do differ. And uh, I do always come back that, you know, one... If we talk to most people in, you know, adults in communities or government decision makers or businessmen or whatever about saving monkeys, there's, there's, not in, there's no interest. You know, we wouldn't even waste our time doing that. We would be sort of doing ourselves a, a, a disservice or shooting ourselves in the foot by, by starting uh, to approach people on that footing. And we, um, instead, we talk about economics and we look at what people grow in their fields and what they their livelihoods are based on and what they need from the forest and the environment in order to sustain those uh, in the long term and we talk about things like that water sheds uh, water supplies fisheries uh, impacts on agricultural yields from local climates pollination all those different things we certainly don't talk about saving the fluffy monkeys uh, thank you ian i think uh, we i have one more question after this but i see molly raise her hand and I'm not sure if Hannah also wanted to say something, or was I mistaken? No? Okay. Then uh, Simon, I see. Uh, so first Molly, and then Simon as the final for this question. Go ahead, Molly. Uh, to address uh, social science, I think for definitely U.S. zoos, having access to a social scientist is a real luxury. Um, I think there might be three zoos in the U.S., San Diego, WCS Bronx, um, who have social scientists on staff, uh, Oregon um, Zoo. So getting access to practitioners who can um, build our own capacity in our institutions um, and conduct that research, that's I think one of our biggest hurdles, one of our biggest challenges, because the social science needs to be at that table when we are at a strategic planning level for our projects, when we are setting conservation targets, um, we need to have the social science there alongside, not the afterthought, because those are going to be the origins of where those conservation education strategies are created. So if we know that there are gaps in knowledge um, or or their negative attitudes around carnivores, that's critical information so that we can then create those conservation strategies. So just I just wanted to reiterate, it's a real luxury, honestly, to have access to social scientists and that research. Um, a lot of it is on the job training for us. Um, we're sending articles, we're reading every book we can, we're trying to devour the information to train ourselves, but we're not trained social scientists. But I think the larger um, zoo and aquarium community is developing and building the capacity of these practitioners. There are committees, there are working groups, there are resources now. So it's growing, but um, access to social science um, practitioners and research, that's, if I had to do my Christmas list, I would put that on there. 
and then Simon to wrap this part up. So um, in, in, in the line of Silent Forest and the Asian Songbird Crisis, we actually had to do our Christmas list. And uh, one of them was to have social science uh, as a priority, and it happened. So uh, with uh, Chester Zoo financed and um, Metro, um, Manchester Metro uh, University, they're doing a, a wonderful uh, PhD work. There's some excellent results coming out in understanding the, the use and the consumption and the people being the consumers of songbirds in, in the trade in Asia, and particularly in Indonesia. So, so it is really a very important part. And, and actually, if not doing the science and then kind of um, uh, uh, asking for it, like Molly said, put it on your Christmas list and uh, hopefully it, it will be done. And to Peter, there's a, um, there's a thanks for this good question, but there's a wonderful uh, mixed discipline to this aspect. If you like birds and you like social science and then actually ethno ornithology is a separate discipline. And that's researchers looking into what local communities, how they respond to certain species and what kind of folklore stories. And it's really interesting to, to dip into and to understand when you're working in an area, how if there's research happening in, in that area and, and as certain species may have a, a important meaning socially or culturally, there might be stories you can pick up on and use in your education and conservation efforts. So it's, it's really important. Thank you, Simon. Um, I think well, I, I did have a few um, a few more questions, but I know that we will not be able to handle them in this session. Uh, I just uh, briefly chatted with Laura, and we'll probably post these questions up on the Facebook group, um, and she'll talk about that a little bit more in the wrap up. But um, I, uh, before we actually completely wrap up, I would like to uh, hand over first to uh, Mario who started the session, session actually, and maybe you can give some, some wrap-up comments from your side uh, as an education committee person and conservation committee person. Go ahead, Mario. Yes, so uh, thank you everyone. Thank you, panelists. Really interesting opinions, comments and stories. And uh, so how to wrap up all this information received in such a short time, but uh, in, uh, as a general comment, we all have realized that in-situ education is really valuable, but you really need to know what you're doing there in the in-situ uh, projects and what do you want to is achieve. And so it's also much about understanding the social aspects and the culture so uh, the educators and the staff needs to be really connected and, and from the very beginning. So like just sending anyone there uh, without knowing the, the circumstances uh, might not be as helpful as the long-term connection. And uh, the experience and knowledge we, we received from in-situ projects, in-situ education and, and the work done there, I think it will enhance the conservation messages in the zoo surroundings. It's important to bring those stories to our audiences in the zoos. And uh, it was interesting to hear that uh, as we, we've, we've been talking about this, having educators working in the institute project, what is it, but also acknowledging that uh, other staff, zoo staff, is also very valuable and invited to join when, when it's possible. Uh, and also I think we need more in-situ community community engagement inside EASA. And uh, I warmly welcome more in situ stories, stories and experiences to, to be taken part of uh, our future education conferences. And uh, I hope there is a whole new in situ educator generation coming up. And one more thing, as we know, uh, the new EU biodiversity strategy uh, 2030 has been launched this May and zoos and aquariums we are mentioned there uh, for our role in raising public awareness about nature and okay EASA is proud to join this EU-led global biodiversity coalition referenced in this strategy 
but um, we do so much more for the con conservation. And um, I think that um, zoo educators, especially those working both in in situ and ex situ uh, around surroundings, they can raise awareness of the conservation work zoos do. So both in the zoo and in the natural environments, not to forget the fundraising and expertise work. So that was my wrap up. And uh, now Laura and Meryl, please continue. And once more, thanks everybody joining this panel session. Um, I'm not 100% sure if Laura and, or I should do this. Uh, I know that Laura has uh, uh, some information to share. So maybe you can put that up. Um, yes, so this is information that we would like to share uh, to everybody. Um, but I do want to also thank uh, all the panelists. Uh, thank you so much for the preparation that we, we, that we had some preparation talks that were very interesting. And, and as you said, we will be able to talk about this much more. And I hope that we can continue to collaborate on, on future uh, items as well. Um, Laura, do you have anything to add? Laura? I think you're on mute. Yeah, on mute, yes, that's probably the best thing to do, first of all. Um, so yeah, echoing the thanks for, for all of our panelists. It's been really wonderful to hear you speak and uh, uh, we could definitely have continued this discussion and, and I hope that we will be able to um, in, in the future. It's been really valuable. Um, and I think, yeah, we're just first steps of seeing, you know, what we can do to uh, increase the, the power of, of this collaborative work. Uh, so a few kind of final actions that would encourage people to take. Um, you're very welcome to join our conservation education Facebook group. Uh, I've put the link into the chat a couple of times, so hopefully you can find it there. Um, and if you are joining that, then uh, please help out our moderators um, by putting answering the question about where, where you're from, or just put a note saying, I got the link from this session, uh, just so that we know that we can quickly approve you. Uh, and in the hopes of continuing this discussion, um, our education committee has uh, decided that we're going to be doing a, web a webinar series. So we should be launching uh, in November a few different potential topics. Um, and I think that this is definitely a conversation that, that would be good uh, to continue. Uh, and I know we were hoping that we would get to bring in um, a little bit of a discussion about standards and how that links to uh, in situ work, uh, the work that we're doing in zoos and aquariums. Um, and I really hope that will be a topic that we can cover in webinars in more detail. Um, and then finally, uh, this one is, is more Merrill's department, but I would say uh, I also keep track of this. If you're an EASA member, then please make sure that your uh, conservation education projects are being added to our conservation database as well. And if you want any more information about that, then please uh, contact Merrill, who will be very happy to help you uh, get started with that process. Indeed. So I think yeah. that that wraps it up, right? Yeah, a few questions um, just coming in about uh, recording something. Oh. So we've had this on Facebook, um, so you can go back and rewatch on Facebook and we will be uploading it to our YouTube channel. So these will be publicly available so you can share or watch again um, freely. And yeah, thank you, everybody. Yeah, I hope to see you in one of the other sessions that are still coming up.